Good morning, church family. As we open the Word of God today, let's ask Him to open our minds and hearts that we may hear and understand the things of His Word. We're looking today at Daniel 12, verse 1, where the Bible predicts a time of trouble and as we think in terms of trouble, we're already experiencing a time of trouble. Lord, open our hearts and our ears and our minds. Open our entire being to be receptive of your word today and speak through me so that your word can be understood clearly plainly. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bible with me to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 where it speaks of Michael, the archangel, Jesus standing up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered every one that shall be found written in the book what a promise of deliverance from trouble as we continue looking at Daniel for the third Sabbath in a row we find freedom to share Jesus. We find freedom to take a stand for the Sabbath. We've been given the freedom of choice. We know that from the book of Revelation that the freedom we now have will be curtailed. The time has come for all of us to share the need for religious freedom with others. Putting religious freedom into action is what we're called to do. Someone said there's more religion in a loaf of bread than one might think. We must show people that Christianity makes a real difference in one's life. When you help someone in need, when you give something called food to the hungry, someone whose basic needs are not being met, you're putting religious, religious freedom into action when you help that person. Helping someone who doesn't have a job or helping someone in prison or someone having trouble in their home or trouble with their health or with their finances. You're actually putting practical religious liberty into practice but forcing our beliefs on someone else would be withholding religious freedom from that individual. The power of choice is so precious. What will you do with it? Will you choose God's truth or the enemy's lie? Satan craves to be worshipped. He will make it miserable for those who choose to believe and worship God. He has accused God of being oppressive, harsh, unjust, unloving, along with many other false accusations. He continues to accuse God of death dealing and pain causing, yet all the death and destruction and hatred and pain and deformity and disease, all lies and broken covenants and all the evil recorded in history and all the evil around us that we see every day can be traced back to Satan, the enemy. If God did not intervene, the enemy would deal out the ultimate destruction as he tortures and persecutes and destroys. Please turn with me to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, and see what it has to say about this very topic. Revelation 12 and verse 9 and the great dragon was cast out 
There was war in heaven, verse 7 says. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought with his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Satan is the enemy of religious freedom. He knows that the truth will set people free. He does not like religious liberty. So Satan joined the church, as it were. He brought in paganism. Then he made war on the scriptures and Bibles were burned. Then he applied force. Anybody violating his law was a heretic and could be put to death. More than 50 million of God's people died as they were burned alive, eaten by wild animals and killed in numerous other ways. Worst of all, they were slain by the church. People were filled with hope as great religious leaders rose up. The Reformation broke out. The power of the apostate church was broken. People flocked to a new land called America to enjoy a country without a king or a pope. Satan now is especially angry. And there's a new development. We'll also find that in Revelation 12 and verse 17. Let's look at that and see what the new development is. Revelation 12 and verse 16. Sorry, rather, verse 17. Revelation 12 and verse 17. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast and unto the words until the words of God be fulfilled to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled people are living in total dependence in Jesus who are these people they keep the commandments of God and have the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10. Adds clarity. As we look at Revelation 19. Verse 10. Ask God. For clarification. And ask him. For understanding. And the power to serve him. Rather than Satan. And I fell at his feet. To worship him. And he said unto me, Seest thou do it not? I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren. And we have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Yes. It's amazing as we walk together, as we talk together, as we work together for the cause of Christ, we must encourage dialogue and promote teamwork. Do we know how to create a safe environment when things go wrong among us? How do you want to be treated? How do you want to treat others? How do you think I want to be treated? How will we resolve conflicts? How can we build more trust in one another and more trust in God, the Almighty? How can we find new ways of serving others and lending helping hands? What methods have you found to be most effective as you seek to influence others? What are the least effective methods? Why focus on building and repairing trust when trust has been damaged? Which must come first? Building trust or repairing trust? On our money in America, 
these words are plainly stated. In God we trust. President Woodrow Wilson said, If we're trying to do a futile thing, if we do not know where we have come from, or what we have been about in our religious freedom, with our God which he has given to us, the power of choice to decide who to trust, God or Satan, I have found God to be completely trustworthy. Is our focus on doctrine or duty, piety or rules, doubts and fears, or is our focus on Jesus Christ? Is our focus on Christ and a humble desire to obey and to change? Has the voice of God become real in your life? Do you want to serve God and others? In our country, have we forgotten where we have come from and what we've been about? Jesus said, I must go about my father's business. In Luke 2, 49, how much have Americans forgotten concerning their history? Why did America separate itself from Britain? Was it because of tribulation or taxation without representation? Now, those are acceptable answers for many. However, taxation without representation is only one of 27 grievances listed in the Declaration of Independence. Abuse of representation powers, the abuse of military powers, the abuse of judicial powers, they were listed. These abuses were listed up to 11 times more than taxation. We should be interested in the moral character of our country. Religious liberty, historically, has been an important reason behind American separation from Great Britain. Many ministers were behind the founding of our civil government. John Adams said that two ministers, Jonathan Mayhew and Dr. Samuel Cooper, were two of the individuals most conspicuous and most influential in the awakening of the principles leading to our independence. Other ministers that were listed include George Whitfield, James Caldwell, John Gabriel Mullenberg, and many more. Books such as Chaplains and Clergy, the Pulpit and American Revolution, Preachers of the American Revolution. These books speak directly of the role of Christian ministers in the founding of our government. Sermon topics ranged from artillery sermons to election sermons. Sermons were preached regularly before John Hancock and before Samuel Adams, who both were signers of the Declaration of Independence as well as sermons preached before the council, and before the senate, and before the house of representatives. Ministers were invited to preach addressing biblical principles concerning lawmaking. Consider how God sent his ministers, called prophets, to minister to and to confront civil leaders. Elijah with Ahab. Samuel with Saul, Isaiah with Manasseh, Jeremiah with Josiah, Nathan with David, and many others. Consider the words of various signers of the Declaration of Independence. Samuel Adams said, I rely on the merits of Jesus Christ for pardons of my sins. Charles Carroll said, Only the mercy of my Redeemer I rely on for salvation and his merits not on the works I have done in obedience to his precepts. John Witherspoon said, I entreat you in the most earnest manner to believe in Jesus Christ, for there is no salvation in any other, Acts 4.12. Robert Payne declared, 
I am constrained to express my adoration of the Supreme Being and the author of my existence in full belief of his forgiving mercy revealed to the world through Jesus Christ. Richard Stockton said, I subscribe to the entire belief of the great and leading doctrines of the Christian religion and the life held up in the Christian system is calculated for the most happiness that can be enjoyed in this moral state. Benjamin Rush said, My only hope of salvation is in the infinite, transcendent love of God manifested to the world by the death of His Son upon the cross. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Revelation 22, 20. Robert Sherman, a signer of both the Declaration of the Independence and a signer of the Constitution, declared, I believe there is only one living and true God existing in three persons that at the end of this world there will be a resurrection of the dead and a final judgment where the righteous shall be acquitted by Christ the judge and admitted to everlasting life. These leaders in our earthly early government were Christians as were the majority of the other early leaders. Things are different now. The contemporary church is often a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. Today, less than 20% of Americans attend church. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the power structure of the average community, is consoled by the church's silent and often vocal sanction of things as they are. Martin Luther King in the Birmingham jail said, If the church today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authentic ring and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning. A.W. Tozar, author and minister, said, If Christianity is to receive a rejuvenation, there must appear a new type of preacher. The proper ruler of the synagogue will never do. Neither will the priestly type who carries out his duties, takes his pay and asks no questions, nor the smooth-talking pastoral type who knows how to make the Christian religion acceptable to everyone. All these have been tried and found wanting. Another kind of religious leader must arise among us. That person must be of the old prophet type, a person that has seen visions of God and heard voices from heaven, from the throne. This person will stand out and will contradict and denounce and protest in the name of God. They will earn the hatred and opposition of a large segment of Christianity. Concerning, concerning religious liberty, Senator Robert Owen placed in the congregation, congressional record of April 25, 1916, the following statement concerning America. The Holy Alliance, having destroyed popular government in Spain and Italy, had well laid plans also to destroy popular government in the American colonies under the influence of the successful example of the United States. Many years earlier, the Vatican condemned the Declaration of Independence as wickedness and called the Constitution of the United States a satanic document. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet will come together in mutual hate of those who keep the commandments of God and are guided by the testimony of Jesus. A great test will come to God's people, even worse than during the Dark Ages, Religious liberty as we've enjoyed it will be taken away. 
Some will be cast in dark dungeons and left there to die. Ministers, laypersons, and those who taught the scriptures to others will be arrested. Families will be separated from one another. Pretenders and hypocrites will fall away. They will become bitter enemies of their former brothers and sisters in the faith. We must overcome the challenges and build strong, positive relationships. We must do this now. Children will turn against their parents. A sure and powerful hand will guide God's people. They will have learned to follow God's will and leadership through the inspiration he gives to his servants. We will truly walk by faith. Thousands will abandon the truth. Others will take their places. The heavens will roll back, revealing the coming of Jesus Christ. Christ is coming. On which side will you be standing? Amen.